Amen. Well, glad you guys are here. You doing okay? Are you? I'm going to sit down here and talk to you a little bit. You know, um, we're living in a very interesting time, aren't we? Um, all that I see and hear on the news is about this little virus that is out there. And we see people responding and reacting in all kinds of different ways. You've probably seen it in your neighborhood or your community or you've gone to the store and seen people doing crazy things at the store and stocking up. But um, I want us to just take a deep breath and realize some things. Here's what God says in his word. It says, oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. You enclose me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. You did form my inward parts. You did weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, O Lord, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book they were written. The days that were ordained for me, when yet there was not one of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God, how vast are some of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand on the sea. I want you to soak in the word of God. Because my words are fluff. God's words are eternal. God's words are powerful. And I think it's important as Christ followers that we understand that God is alert and aware of all that's going on in your life, and he's alert and aware of all that's going on in the world. Never are you going to hear this from heaven. <gasps> <laughs> that will never sound from heaven. There's never a... <gasps> <gasps> because God is in control. So all that we hear are gasps from sheep who are wandering around going, oh, no, there's a virus. We better run. And it's important for you and I as Christ followers to understand the big fear of the virus. Here's the big fear. Is what? Death. That's the big fear. Because people understand sickness. We're all going to be sick. We've all experienced sickness. That's not the fear. The fear isn't that I'm going to get sick. The fear is I'm going to what? Die. And that's what people are so backing away from is I don't want to die. I don't want to give this virus to someone who will die. I don't want to, as I heard on CNN, I don't want someone, one of my loved ones, to die before their time. Do you realize today as we sit here that no one dies before their time? The Bible tells us that the Lord has ordained the day that you and I will die. Maybe it's from coronavirus COV-19. Maybe it was from the swine flu 10 years ago, H1N1. 
Maybe it was from Ebola. Maybe it's from a car accident. Maybe it's from a heart attack. Maybe it's from a brain hemorrhage. Maybe it's from whatever it is. Everyone will die. So I want us all to just understand the reality that the world's responding in fear to death. But as a Christ follower, we do not have to fear death. Death is not the enemy because we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and the sting of death is gone. Because no matter what happens to each one of us in this room or anybody in Amador County or California or the United States or the world, if you love Jesus and He is your Savior and Redeemer, on the other side of life on this planet is eternity. Think about that. No matter when you take your last breath, right away you're in eternity. And God says, you can't even imagine all that I've prepared for you. In fact, Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. Gain, gain is what? Better, is more profitable, is more exciting. There's gain. So, I just want all of us in this family to take a deep breath, and I'm glad you're here because that, again, just reminds us that there is more to life than the fear of whatever is out there in the world that is running through the brush fire, and we can stand strong in the Lord and the strength of His might because we love Jesus, and we know that there is more to death or to, more to life than these few short years. There is eternity. And remember this. Throughout the ages, there have always been sicknesses that have encompassed humanity. And remember this, that throughout the ages, Christ followers have always been the ones that have ran toward the sickness rather than away. They have said, we will help, we will encourage, we will do what we can to help those that are suffering. Why would they do that? Because they're not afraid, are they, Lynn? They're not afraid of getting the bubonic plague. Now, the coronavirus is nothing like the bubonic plague, but Christ followers were running to help those with the bubonic plague, not afraid of dying because they knew that there is more to life than these few short years and there is eternity. So, as we get into God's Word today, I just wanted to encourage you with just a little bit of reality from the Word of God that you and I as Christ followers can be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. We don't have to fear. God said, do not fear. Do not anxiously look about you. Don't run to the store and buy all the toilet paper and all the things and think you're going to... Don't, you don't need to anxiously look about you. He said, for I'm your God. I am your God. We rely on Yahweh. We trust Him. And you know what? Even if there was no more toilet paper or food or whatever it was, guess what? Our hope is in the Lord. Our strength is in who Jesus is. He is the one that we count on. So, Christ followers, be encouraged. You are the people that God has for this moment at this time in Amador County to bump elbows with people who may be running in fear. You can put your arms around them and give them hope. Let them know that there is hope in Jesus, that security is not in a vaccine that may come in the next six months or whatever. Security is in Jesus. And you can rest there. So be encouraged. Don't give up. Let the world know that Jesus is the answer. And uh, this might be a great week to be able to share what it means to love Jesus as Savior with some of your friends and neighbors, huh? Good. Are you going to take Daisy to Children's Church? Or are we going to stay here? You tell me. Now, you are welcome if you want because I feel like you were a little bit more intimate if you want to scoot close or if you say, no, I need six feet of distance from everybody, so I'm going to stay away. But um, if you feel comfortable, I'm going to invite you, everybody, to scoot up just a little bit so that we're a little bit more um, cozy. So let's be a little cozy today. 
a little cozy. Unless you feel... <laughs> All right. 2020, we're now two and a half months into this brand new year. And as we have started this year in this church, we said we want to be reminded that being strong in the Lord and the strength of his might is key because there's so many things going on, so many changes, so many crazy ideas that have come in and, and made a difference in the world. So we want to be strong in the Lord and take advantage of his strength, don't we? And part of that reality is putting on the armor of God that we've been talking about over the past few months because that armor is what the Bible tells us we need in order to stand strong against the schemes of the devil and to resist in the evil day. We've, all, we've learned, do we get this armor automatically when we become a Christ follower? No. We get salvation when we become a Christ follower. And when we become a Christ follower, we step across the line into the enemy's camp because the enemy does not want Christ followers to succeed and gain the strength of the Lord. That's why God says, put on this armor because now you're going to be attacked. And we've learned that this armor is not something that you put on and off, is it? It's something that you put on permanently, right, Randall? Yes, sir. Because it's needed in the battle. Everybody with me? Somebody tell me what this is. Okay, the Bible says to gird our loins with what? Truth. Truth. And what does that mean? Gird our loins with what? That with Jesus, we looked at the word and we saw that God, his attribute is truth. He is absolute truth. Jesus is God in the flesh. His word is truth. So if we're going to gird our loins with truth at the core of who we are, needs to be Jesus and his word, right? If that is reality, then we are well on our way to standing firm against the schemes of the devil. We then talked about what? The breastplate of righteousness or the bulletproof vest of righteousness. And what is righteousness? Right living. Okay. Now, right living is determined by culture, correct? No, it is not. Right living is determined by the Word of God. The Word of God. So righteousness, right living is what happens when a person becomes a Christ follower and God begins to change them from the inside out. It's their actions and their behavior, and that protects their spiritual heart or the real person, who they are. Because when you are living righteously or with right living, you don't have to worry about the IRS knocking on your door, do you? You don't have to worry about the sheriff arresting you in the middle of the night. You don't have to worry about your neighbor's husband coming over and getting revenge. You don't have to worry about losing your house because you've gambled it all away at the casino. Because of what? Righteousness. That protects the real you. So we've talked about girding our loins with truth, righteousness. We've also talked about what? Shot in your feet with the gospel of peace. What is that? What did we say that is? With confidence, having your, sh your feet shod with confidence that you are a child of the King. Confidence that Jesus is the answer, huh? Because when you are living in this world and the enemy is trying to distract you, you have to have confidence that you're part of the family of God and you have to have confidence that Jesus is the answer. Key part of standing firm. Not only did we talk about the shoes of the gospel of peace, but what else did we talk about? The shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? Giving you a little test this morning. What's the shield of faith? 
Okay, believing that what God says is true. Because here's how this works. The enemy, the Bible says, is going to be throwing flaming missiles, flaming arrows at you, temptation, schemes, etc. And he's going to be saying, hey, Barbara, Barbara, you deserve to do this. Robert, come on, color outside the lines a little bit. Franco, you know what? You don't get what you need. I've got what you need that's going to make you happy. When the enemy comes and says those things, you either believe the enemy or you use your shield of faith, which is you believe what God says. That's the question. And if you believe what God says and the enemy comes, you're saying, nope, I'm not going to believe what you say. I'm not going to accept what you say. I'm going to use my shield of faith, believing what God says rather than what Satan says rather than what culture says, rather than what the world says, and rather than what your friends say, the shield of faith. We also talked about the helmet of salvation. What is this? Tell me what this is. What does this mean? What did we say the, the Bible is telling us to put on? something for our minds it's amazing how quiet it can get <laughs> the helmet of salvation is what what does it have to do with salvation. what does it have to do with um, obviously it has to do with salvation Franco we appreciate that help us out has to do with Belief. believing what Lynn Okay, remember the helmet of salvation has to do with your mind and it's not talking about being saved because these are already Christ followers that Paul is writing to, correct? So it has to do with what you believe about salvation. Remember salvation has three aspects, past, present, and future. The past is when you become a Christ follower, you are saved, redeemed from the what? Penalty of sin. That's the past. When you trust Jesus, the penalty of sin is already taken care of. It's all done. The present, that's called justification. The present, you are what? Being sanctified. You are redeemed from the power of sin. Sin no longer has power over you. You have power to overcome sin, right? Because you are a Christ follower. And then when you take your last breath, the Bible says one day you're going to be free from the presence of sin because you will be glorified in heaven forever. So it's important that you know that because if you have the wrong understanding of salvation, you go, oh, I can lose my salvation. I'm not saved. How is that going to affect you in battle? Yeah, you're going to be weak, doubt, fear. So those are the areas that we have approached. And there is one more piece of armor that we are going to talk about today. And so it's important that we open our Bibles. Did you bring your Bibles today? Hold them up. Repeat after me. This is the Word of God. God. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I love the Word of God. Father, thank you again for your Word. Use it today to bring us closer. Allow us to see clearly what it is that you have for us. And we pray this in your powerful name, Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Guess where we're at? Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. This is what we're memorizing. You guys doing okay on the memory stuff, or are you going like, yeah, I'm not really working on it? Need to work on it. Need to do better. You're going to see today. And what we talk about, why memorizing is so key. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, help me out, say it as much as you can with me. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the 
rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of a peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming missiles. Oops, my fault. That's the old version. All the flaming arrows of the evil one. Helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. You know, by the end of the year, you're going to say, I got that down. No problem. So we're going to start today with the final piece of the armor, the last piece that's talked about here, which is the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit. And here's a couple things I want you to know as we begin to unpack this picture, because this is a weapon that is meant for us to use as we stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The sword of the Spirit that is talked about here in Ephesians chapter 6 is not a large sword that soldiers would use in battle that they would take with two hands. And remember, they would try and heave it over the shield to try and make that devastating blow on a helmet. That's not the sword that is talked about here. The sword that is talked about here is a small sword or a dagger anywhere 12 to 18 inches long that is designed to be used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's the sword that is talked about here in Ephesians chapter 6. The sword. Important. With all the other pieces of armor... These are all used to keep you standing firm against the blows of the enemy, against his schemes, against his flaming arrows, missiles. This is the only piece that God has designed for what? It's for the offense part, the offensive part of this picture. This is to be used in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy when you are being attacked, the sword. Okay? Now, the Bible says this is the sword of the Spirit. Who's the Spirit? God, the Holy Spirit. This is a weapon that is designed by the Holy Spirit and He gives it to you and I to be used in the spiritual realm. This is the one piece that is designed to cut through time, space, and matter into the invisible realm that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 6. The sword of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has given you and I a weapon that can be used in our lives for whatever's happening to you right now that can pierce through time, space, and matter into the invisible realm where this struggle that Paul is talking about is going on. Make sense? So, the sword of the Spirit which is what? Which is the Word of God. Now, nothing could be more fundamental 
to you and I in human knowledge than that God has caused His Word to be written down in a form which man can comprehend. Think about that for just a minute. God has caused His Word, allowed His Word to be written down in a form that you and I can comprehend. Woo! And He's preserved this Word, His Word, through the ages of human history so that you and I can have that Word today. God's Word is the accurate recording of truth. God's Word is the accurate recording of truth. It is God-breathed. Just think of his, God's breath. This is God's breath. It is His truth that has been accurately recorded for you and I as His children to use in 2020. It is divine revelation. What is divine revelation? What does that mean? From God is divine. It is not human, is it? It is divine revelation. And it presents materials and facts which could not otherwise be known by man unless they were revealed by God. An example is what we're studying, right? Studying about this spiritual warfare, about this spiritual struggle. If we didn't have that revealed to us by God, we wouldn't even know that it was existing. God's Word is revelation from Him that presents facts and material that could not be understood without being revealed by God. You can write down these verses. I'm going to just tell you what they say. Matthew 5.18 talks about the words in this book being inspired. All the words are inspired. Luke 16 says everything in this book is inspired. Matthew 1 talks about these words being spoken through men by God. Acts 28 says the Holy Spirit spoke through men. Psalms 19 tells us that this is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture, not just some of it, but all Scripture is inspired by God. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. We quote that every Sunday as we hold up God's Word. 2 Peter 1 tells us that God acted in writing this book. Isaiah 40 talks about God's words standing forever. And Matthew 24 reminds us that God's words will never pass away. There is no other book, no other book in existence that can claim all these things but God's word. This is is the Bible. And it is key for all of us as Christ followers to understand that this is a very important part of our spiritual armor. The Word of God. I'm going to take you a little deeper. You ready to go a little deeper? When we open the Word of God and we read it, what we're going to find is there are actually three different words that are used in the original language talking about this book. Three different words. We're going to explore those a little bit this morning to help us understand exactly what the Bible is talking about when it talks about this. The sword of the Spirit. The first word that the Bible uses, oops, let's go just to the first one. The first one is the word graphi. 
Take your Bibles and open up to Matthew chapter 21. I want you to see where this word is used. Matthew chapter 21. Verse 42. Matthew 21, verse 42. And I always encourage you, when you're using your Bible, write in your Bible, highlight in your Bible, make a little note in your Bible. It's good because it will help you remember when you go back and you see what you have written. Matthew chapter 21, verse 42 says this. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the graphe? What's the word there? Scripture. Scriptures. Did you never read in the scriptures? What are the scriptures? The word of, Bible. The word of God. Okay. The graphe. Matthew 22, verse 29 says this. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the graphe, the what? The scriptures or the power of God. So we see as we walk throughout the Bible that there is this word, the graphe, which has to do with the written word of God. Okay? The written word of God, this book. We ought to, a lot of times I'll say the Word of God is our map, our chart, our GPS. This written Word is what I'm referring to. Does that make sense? Okay. That's one of the words that's used when we talk about the Word of God. The other one is logos. You're probably more familiar with this word. You might have heard it a little bit more often. The logos is the living word of God, the message that is given, the living word or the message, the divine expression of the word of God. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 1, a verse that you probably are familiar with. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the what? The Logos. The Logos, that's the word there. The living word. We go down to verse 14. And the Logos became flesh. The word became flesh. The Logos is the message, the living word, the divine expression. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You getting sleepy yet? Good. S stay sharp. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word, guess what word that is there? The Logos, for the Logos of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. A verse we've memorized. So when it says the Word of God is living, the Logos, it's talking about when you receive the message when you receive the message of God and it impacts your life, that's the Word of God, the living Word of God. There's a difference between carrying the Word of God, right? Carrying, you're carrying the graphe, aren't you? When you hold on to this and you walk, you carry the graphe. When you open up the Word and you read it and it makes an impact in your life, what is that? That's the Logos, okay? So just because you carry the Word of God doesn't mean it's being powerful in your life. It's living in your life, is it? You're just carrying a map. You're just carrying a chart. 
the Word of God. But the Logos is the living Word of God, the divine expression, that which makes a difference in your life. So when, example, if opening up the Word, we're studying it on a Sunday, and you go, wow, that's powerful. I like that. I get it. What is that? That's the Logos, the living Word, okay? That's what makes an impact in your life. Now, I've got to tell you, neither one of those words are the words that are used in Ephesians chapter 6. So when the Bible says that God has given us this sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, he's not talking about the written word that, that you carry around. He's not talking about the living word. There's another word that is used there, and that word is called the rhema, the rhema which talks about or refers to the spoken word. The spoken word. A command, an utterance, a word to be declared. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 12. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Word that is declared, okay? Rhema. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 says this, And I say to you that every careless word, rhema, word that is declared, word that is spoken, every word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. Go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Verse 37 and 38 says, For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bondslave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your rhema, to your spoken word. And the angel departed from her. So there are three different words. There is the written word, the graphe. There is the living word, which is the logos, which as you read the word and it speaks to you, that's the logos. Then there is the rhema word, the spoken word of God. No, these are Greek. Greek. Good question, Lynn. So when we're talking about the rhema word of God, the spoken word of God, that is the weapon that is being spoken of here in Ephesians chapter 6. So what God is not saying, he's not saying as you carry around your Bible, that is your weapon, is he? Okay. He's not saying as you read your Bible, that is your weapon, is he? What is he saying? As you what? As you speak spoken word, as you speak the Bible, that is your weapon. Now, I'm going to say this. I'll say it again a little bit later. You see the written word. You read the word. And as you read the word, you understand the word. So the graphe you read, the logos is what makes an impact. And the rhema is what you use in battle. If you do not open up the graphe and understand the logos, you will never have the rhema for the battle. I want to say that one more time because you've got to catch this. Okay? If you do not open up the graphe 
and understand the logos, you will never have a rhema word for the battle. Does that make sense? Okay. So, as we are walking through this picture, it is important that we understand that if we are going to succeed in battle, we have to have the rhema word of God. Think about this. There's a spiritual struggle that's going on. There's a spiritual battle. You are in the battle. And the enemy is impacting your life, whether it's through culture, through temptation, through sin, through his schemes. He is throwing his arrows, his missiles, his fiery missiles at you. And you have got your armor and you're trying to stand strong against there. But you have got to do something to to stop this, to stop this attack, to stop this struggle, what do you need to use? Your rhema, the rhema word of God. There's a lot of Christ followers, instead of using the rhema, they say, well, this is what I think. This is my opinion. This is what my friends say. This is what the doctor told me. This is what my psychologist said. But they don't use the rhema. Do you realize that Satan is not afraid of your words, Barbara? He's not afraid of my words. This is my opinion, Satan. Satan goes, get out of here. I'm going to squish you like a little cockroach that you are. Okay? Okay? This is, this is what my mama told me. Satan goes, I don't care what your mama told you. I'm going to squish you like a little cockroach. This is what my daddy says. This is what my friends say. This is what Dr. Phil says. This is what Oprah says. This is what CNN says. Satan goes, I'll squish you like a little cockroach because I am not afraid of your words. What is Satan afraid of? The rhema, the spoken word of God. And I'm going to take you to the best illustration in all of the Bible. Open to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. When you're there, say amen. Amen. This is good. Are you ready? Verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came in and said to him, If you are the Son of God... Command that these stones become bread. And Jesus answered and said, What? It is written. He pulled out the rhema, didn't he? He pulled out the rhema and he said, It is written, man shall not. Live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The rhema. Satan says, okay, enough of that. And what happened? He said, okay, we're not going to worry about that. Let's go on to something else. Because the rhema was a problem, wasn't it? The rhema was a problem. So the devil took him into the holy city And he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, You are the Son of God. Throw yourself down, for it's written, He will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus then says, On the other hand, it is written, pulls out his rhema, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him 
to a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things will I give you if you will just fall down and worship me. That's what Satan has been wanting from the beginning, for God to worship him. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is what? It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil, what? Left him. Jesus used the rhema word of God in the battle. That is key for us to understand because as we walk through this picture and as we deal with the enemy, God has given us the armor that we need to stand firm. As the enemy tries to push against us and get us off target, but the Holy Spirit has said, I'm going to give you a weapon, a weapon that you can put in your hands that can pierce through time, space, and matter into the invisible realm. And when that weapon is put into the invisible realm, it makes a difference in your life and in the struggle. But you know we have a problem as Christ followers? Because there's a lot of Christ followers that will never use the rhema, the spoken word. Satan knows that. He knows they'll, they'll say, well, here's what, here's what my mom told me. Here's what my dad told me. Here's what my husband told me. Here's what my friends told me. Here's what the doctor told me. And they will never say, wait a minute, here's the word. Here's the word. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And I'm not going to be conformed to this world. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Take that, Satan. <laughs> Right? That is the rhema. But if a Christ follower is not going to open up the graphe and let the logo speak to them, they will never have a rhema word. And you know why so many Christ followers struggle? They go, man, the pressure's on, the struggle's on, I, feel so, I don't feel like anything's happening because they never use the rhema. They never do. You see why it's so important to get the Word of God off the page and into your life? Because it's a weapon. It's a weapon designed to pierce through that invisible realm that you and I can't see. You and I may have put on the armor that says, okay, we're going to stand firm as the enemy tries to prevail against us, but we have nothing to keep him away. So here's my encouragement to you today. Do you have one of these? Or... Do you just... Carry this around. There's a difference between these two. You know what? Some people just carry this around and go, hey, you know, I, I hold on to my Bible, and then they put it in the back seat of their car, and it goes under their coffee table, and the enemy comes and attacks, and they go, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? They never pull out the rhema. Because they haven't been in the graphe, letting the logos speak to them. You know you can't make up rhema words. <laughs> you can't make them up. And rhema words, God's word, is the only word that will pierce through that invisible realm and make an impact in the spiritual battle. So we have a choice. 
have a choice, Christ followers. Use a rhema or sit at home and let the enemy attack you. So, wherever you are, go farther. If you, have, if you haven't been opening the graphe, start opening the graphe. If you haven't been reading and allowing the logos to speak to you, let it speak to you. And then you need to get that rhema off the page and into your life so that when the enemy comes, you can say, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring my soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing my heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening my eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. You can use the word of God and you can say, I'm not going to do that. Because you have the spoken word of God. God has given you a weapon. He's given me a weapon. Speak rhema words in the midst of the battle, and you will see, as the Bible says, submit yourself, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How did Jesus resist the devil? The spoken word. He didn't go, oh, well... I have an idea what I should do here. He spoke the word of God. So Randall, when you're struggling, the enemy's coming, use the rhema. Anna, when the enemy comes and tries to get you depressed and say, God's not going to do that, use the rhema. Use the rhema. You know, that's true for Paul. Down in his Shop down there on Main Street, the enemy comes and says, Paul, you, no, you can't. Use the rhema and say, yes, I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Take that, Satan. Huh? So, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood, is it? But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We need the rhema. So wherever you are today, if you don't have one, get one. Make sure you're in the graphe, letting the logo speak to you so that you have rhema words. Father, we thank you today for the privilege we have to see and understand your word more clearly. I'm thankful that you've given us a sword of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, you have given us a weapon that can pierce into the supernatural realm. And for each and every one of us here today, challenge us. Allow us to see the value of that rhema word. We thank you again today that we can be children of the King, that we know there is more to life than these few short years, and in the struggles that come in the supernatural battle, may we speak your word clearly. We love you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Any questions about anything? Pretty clear?